there's so many things around us that are programming us as, as girls, young girls, um, into shying away from money. But it's time for us to break through that and say, hey, that's not cool. What are your thoughts on the gender pay gap and its impact on women's financial security? And what can be done to address this issue? Mm, good question. Um, I wish I had the answer to this one. It is definitely moving in the right direction. It, we're not there yet. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be one of those things that is incredibly hard for us to overcome for all the reasons I stated earlier in that women take more time out of the office. Not only for maternity breaks, but also uh, a lot of families still are in that very traditional role. So if the school calls because the children are sick, you know, or grandma needs to be taken to the hospital, it's often the woman in the family. Um, but of course, our career responsibilities are sometimes on an even keel with our partners, with our male partners. So to still have all of this domestic burden as well as the career, it's you can see why there's, there's tension. Um, but in terms of the pay gap, one of the things we love to teach at Sophia is negotiating your salary. Because when you start a job, Starting on the right foot is so important because often when you, once you're inside a company, you get incremental increases, but it's nothing compared to that when you're taking that first foot on the, on the ladder into a new company, um, that is your opportunity to start in a great place. So understanding negotiation skills, but I believe that everything comes back to financial education. So if you, if I talk to my six and seven year old now about money as much as I do, when they come being 15, 16 years old and negotiating their first job salary, they are going to be so comfortable around money. There's no shame in talking about money. There's no embarrassment, awkwardness. It's just comfort. It's just like if I said to you, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And can we talk about my salary expectations? They are X. You know, in exactly the same way, it's, it's pure comfort. And the only way for women to get comfortable around, around salary negotiation um, and, the, and addressing the gender pay gap is to start talking about money early and to just socialize it. Get comfortable with your friends, get comfortable talking to your family and slowly broaden that circle so that it just becomes a conversation you can have with your employer around just saying, hey, actually, I think I'm worth more than that. And this is why, this is my data points, this is why. And like you mentioned that those conversations that women can have with each other, they would also reduce inhibitions yeah. as far as discussing money goes. Yeah. Terrific. How do you think financial planning and management can help women to achieve greater independence and empowerment in their personal and professional lives? You know, we have a unique set of career goals or, or, and, and financial goals because we, we have, we have taking time out and we're living longer. We have higher medical bills as well, um, probably because we live longer. So there's, you know, there's lots of different um, needs compared to, compared to men. So planning um, for those unique goals and unique needs is vital. So finding those right people that you resonate with and that resonate with you. Um, is really, really important because if you find someone you trust and you know understands you, um, then I think that's, you know, halfway of half of the battle in order for you to open up and talk about your finances in, in a way that you need to to plan for the future. Yeah, that's why we're so glad you're on the show as well. As a co-founder of Sophia, what advice would you give to aspiring female entrepreneurs? I've founded three companies to date. Um, first, I had a venture capital fund. Um, then I launched Sophia, and I also have a second business called Harriet. It's a lot of work. Um, it is a lot of work. 
I used to think beforehand that it was, you know, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be completely financial freedom. I'm going to, and, and, and autonomy over my time as well. Um, and the reality is quite different. Um, I probably work harder than I've ever worked before with less time than I have, but I'm working on something that is super, like I'm super passionate about. So um, there's no denying, let me throw this out there um, as a, a stat, but there's no denying that as a female entrepreneur, they're going to have, they're likely to have significant challenges when it comes to fundraising, because I think in 2022, fundraising dollars for female entrepreneurs were 1.9%. 1.9% for female founders for them to run their business. That's how much venture capital funding went to women. That is you know, a problem, a huge problem, which would suggest that our venture capital sort of ecosystem is somewhat broken for women. Women are 51% of the population and they're opening just shy of around 40% of all businesses globally. Going into entrepreneurship with your eyes open is always a good thing. And that's not because I think that I want to, you know, warn women off becoming an entrepreneur. We need more female entrepreneurs. We need more female investors. Um, but we have to also be realistic. There are significant challenges at the moment with the current fundraising ecosystem. However, not everyone opens a business to, um, you know, for global domination. You know, there's lots of really great businesses that are just revenue generating, profitable business, sustain, you know, they, they, they are growing, they're just not growing at venture capital rates. Um, this is great too. We have a, you know, a huge number of businesses in the world like, that fall into that category. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and not everyone wants to take a business to an IPO, for example. Um, so um, understanding the amount of work that's gonna go into it, understanding that you probably need to skill up. So if you were an excellent marketing person um, and you want to start a business, what do you know about sales? What do you know about operations? What do you know? I'm exactly there myself. I'm at the moment working out on sales for Sophia. I didn't come from a sales background, but I'm having to accept that I need to learn different areas. Um, I've become a marketing expert, a PR expert, um, did I know anything about those before I launched Sophia or her, her capital, the fund? No. So uh, open mind to the fact you need to learn a lot. Um, open mind to the fact that you need to network because in six months time, in 12 months time, you might want to fundraise. Don't start your networking then from, you know, from, okay, I need money right now. I'm going to go and see if I can raise money. No, start on day one. Start reaching out to angel investment networks, trying to understand in your local area, in your city, your town, you know, make connections, use LinkedIn, be smart about connecting with people and being human, and making connections, human connections with people, because you are most likely to get any money, the first money into your business will be from your friends and family. So make sure you have some, make sure you have some acquaintances, some network of uh, angel investors. Interesting. It comes down to the fundamentals, I think, right? Adapt, upscale, be patient. Yeah. Any other thoughts on how women can improve their financial well-being and achieve greater equality and empowerment in Singapore? Financial empowerment and financial knowledge um, and independence is at the heart of equality and gender equity, actually. Because if we have um, complete freedom to make decisions free from you know, financial concerns, financial worries. So whether that be, I hate my job, like it's it's making me miserable, but I don't have any money. Uh, no one's ever taught me about money. We are beholden to that job. We are a slave to that wage, for um, want of a better term. And we cannot make a decision independent of that. Let's say we are in a relationship that's perhaps not good for us as a lot of couples do, they split responsibilities, um, whether consciously or subconsciously. And um, you might be in control of the investments and say and the, the money and I'll do something else. And so for a lot of women, maybe they're not in control of their finance. They don't know what they have, what's in the bank, what's in investing, where invested, where it is. Again, 
very difficult to make a decision to leave an unhealthy relationship if you know you don't know where your money is and what's going on. And there's lots of things why I think that taking control, being financially savvy, knowledgeable, you know, and taking control, even if you are in a relationship and you've decided that, okay, the male in the relationship is going to do the investments, set a date once a month, going back to money dates, do a money date and say, I don't need to know every minor thing about where the money is, but like, like how's it going this month? Yeah, and I know roughly in my head, this is in this part, this is here, this is there. And how's that performing? And over the, every month you're reviewing that, um, you're not completely handed over all responsibility. So I, my, my opinion would be to never hand over entirely responsibility of your finances to somebody else. It's very difficult um, if, if some challenges arise. So everything comes back to education and it's never too late. I know I said age seven is when our ha money habits are formed, but we can learn, we can unlearn and we can relearn. And that's exactly what Sophia does. It's retraining people to, to think differently. For a lot of women, we need to reframe our mind. You know, I, I grew up watching um, Sex and the City and Shopaholic, Diary of a Shopaholic and all these movies that are there to tell us as women, you're not very good with money, you just spend and you just buy Manolo Blahnik. And this is what women do. And it's just not true. Um, and um, statistically, I think our parents are much more likely to talk to um, the, uh, their sons uh, about money and business compared with their daughters. So there's so many things around us that are programming us as, as girls, young girls, um, into shying away from money. But it's time for us to break through that and say, hey, that's not cool. Um, we need to know about money too, because no longer are we just growing up to have children and stay at home. We're growing up to have careers um, and probably earn a lot of money too. Asia has the fastest growing wealth accumulation hub in, in the world, meaning women in Asia are accumulating money faster than anywhere. And we will overtake North America, which is, has the most women's wealth. Um, and we will overtake that area. So we have more, we have women with more money than ever before. So it's more important than ever before that women are in control of that money and putting that to good because there's so much women can do with that money. Um, for example, women are twice as likely to invest into ESG than men are because we care about our planet and we care about our people. That is good, not only for women, but for the entire planet, for everyone. Thanks so much for sharing, Tanya. I believe this interview will be really beneficial for women. You're welcome, thank you. Tanya and I talked about how women can improve their financial well-being and achieve greater equality and empowerment. Stay tuned for our next episode, which will feature more insights and analysis. I'm Rashan Gidwani, and you've been watching Tea Time Tuesday. Please like and subscribe for more. See you again.